and we are joined now by Stephen Thrasher, journalist, professor of journalism at Northwestern and author of the viral underclass, The Human Toll, When Inequality and Disease Collide. Uh, Stephen, thanks so much for com- uh, joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. So, I mean, I your book's title... I, it borrows the viral underclass. It borrows from a phrase, and you write this, uh, used by AIDS activist uh, Sean Strub. And you know, I know much of your work has focused on the on HIV criminalization and stigma, and that is a very um, prominent through line throughout your book. Uh, why was that frame of reference useful for you in in studying? Uh, pandemics, sickness in general, the COVID-19 pandemic as well, and then like as a conduit into uh, the your work, the, the viral underclass here? Well, I had uh, finished doing my research on the story about Michael Johnson, this young man who had been sentenced to 30 years in prison for HIV uh, transmission and exposure, and eventually we got his sentence overturned. Um, and I, I used as the basis of my research for my doctoral dissertation. I was thinking about how to turn it into a book when COVID-19 happened. And I was looking with some of the people I work with back at my dissertation again, and saw that the final chapter was called the viral underclass. And I was kind of ending that um, that story by thinking about the ways that a viral underclass is produced with HIV criminalization, how Michael was an example of it, how there are other ways to think about it. Uh, and it was actually my, my book editor who said, you know, why don't you step back and think about, this was March of 2020, uh, how that might be a framework to think about COVID-19. And so that was kind of the starting point that I used to think about the pandemic to understand why it is a viral underclass that is produced um, between different pandemics. And I could see that with COVID-19 when I just started turning to the particularities of that virus, which is an extremely different virus from HIV in almost every imaginable way that they behave differently, they act differently, they, they just have very, very different characteristics. But the first people dying of it in those first months were in the sort of maps in the same zones of people I've written about affected by HIV and AIDS. Uh, geographically, politically, demographically, there were lots of similarities. And so I wanted to understand why is it that the same kinds of human beings will end up in the pathways and affected by these extremely different viruses. And once I sort of had that analytic, it gave me a better way to understand how these health disparities come about with HIV or AIDS, hepatitis, monkeypox, um, coronavirus for for many of the pandemics that we go through. I mean, and I, I don't say this lightly, but in, I believe you say this in your book, but this is such a useful lens that you can, I think, put it up there with Naomi Klein's shock doctrine as a way to view these broad uh uh, societal kind of upheavals and look at a lens particularly through that. Was a, that a part of your inspiration? It was. I mean, very, very much so. And I was so incredibly touched when I eventually asked uh, Naomi to blur my book, and she did. But um, her her analysis has been so helpful for me for, for many years in my own understanding of the world as a leftist and an academic and a scholar. Um, and I wanted to think about, you know, this viral underclass, which the term, as you said, was originally coined by Sean Strube, and I would heard activists use it different ways. But I really wanted to use it as an as an analytic to understand the the horrible things that we were seeing in those first couple of months and and then years of the COVID pandemic. And then unfortunately, this last summer with the monkeypox outbreak, I saw almost all the same things playing out Uh, again. Fortunately, the mortality with that virus is much, much, much lower. But the ways that it played out, the missteps, how it came to be, why queer people of color ended up uh, so affected by it. so many of the things worth i could see them through that same analytic uh as you can see with different pandemics across time so um let's you mentioned the story of michael johnson which is another major theme in your book tell his story a little bit because um you know as you write viruses kind of uh both show cracks and widen cracks in society and at, the cracks were were um visible before the pandemic began but there needs to be more sunlight on them and and one of these stories that's so emblematic of that is michael johnson um talk about his story and how he ended up facing trial um for for transmitting HIV? Certainly. So Michael Johnson uh, is, was, was a young man, as he's older now. I've, I've 
been writing about for almost a decade, uh, but he was in his young 20s when he was a college student at a university called Lindenwood University in Missouri. And he was arrested and accused of uh, transmitting HIV to two people and exposing um, three eventually charges were well, four men against him. And for listeners or viewers who are not familiar with it, you can be prosecuted for transmitting a, a wide variety of, of viruses throughout the world and, and pathogens, but the one I've studied the most is HIV. And in most states in the United States and about 70 countries around the world, you can be prosecuted for um, exposing someone to the virus or transmitting it, uh, the, the virus to somebody else, even under circumstances where it can't happen at all. There are people in jails uh, who are accused of spitting with HIV. And it's one of these, uh, it's one of these you know, alleged crimes that gets a sentencing enhancement. So kind of at the most nefarious end of it, if you are um, arrested by a police officer and they bash your head into the ground or their police car and you start bleeding and you have not told them you have uh, HIV before you start bleeding, they can accuse you of trying to murder the police officer. That's kind of at the most nefarious end of it. The way it happens more often is people will say, I injected drugs with this person or I had sex with this person. They didn't tell me their status. And the onus is on the person to prove that they uh, that they did tell it. And these are not good from a public health standpoint because we want people to feel safe and able to disclose their status and know that they'll be taken care of. And so when these high profile cases like Michael's happen, it makes it much more likely that people won't get tested because you can't be prosecuted if you can't be tested. So Michael was a young uh, college student and wrestler he was extremely talented as a wrestler. Like too many uh, athletes, he had gone through college not really being able to read or write very well. And he was very popular on his campus with, with, uh, with athletics, with students, until it came out that he had HIV. And he was accused of uh, exposing, uh, transmitting it to two men and exposing it to several others. And when I first heard about the case, I didn't know much about this topic or about him. The, the news about it had just been prosecutors' press releases as, as if he was some kind of global menace to people people who might get HIV. But when I met him, it, it was a very, very different story. He was um, an extremely uh, interesting and kind young man. He has always maintained that he told his partners his status. And he really became known to me was a scapegoat for all this anxiety that people have around HIV and AIDS. Uh, one thing that happened over the, the many years of, of reporting about him was that the CDC came out with a statistic that one in every two black gay men in the United States were projected to become infected with HIV in their lifetime. And that's a good way to understand. I think that we can't think of viruses as, as individual as individual people negotiating individual risk. If one out of every two people are going to become affected by something, something is deeply wrong in the society with a lack of collective protection to stop mitigation of these kinds of viruses. But Michael was sort of a perfect scapegoat of saying, we're just going to put all of our anxiety onto him, especially since one of his screen names that he used in, in Grindr and social media was Tiger Mandingo. And that word Mandingo just like brings up all this anxiety from US racial history. So he eventually got sentenced um, to 30 years in prison um, and he was facing you know, not coming out until he was almost 60 years old. Uh, fortunately, supporters of his used my reporting and, um, and used other information to mount an appeal, and his conviction was eventually overturned, uh, and he got out after about six years in prison. But he still lost most of his 20s. He was in prison from 22 till he was almost 29 years old. Um, and so that was kind of the way that I started to think about and understand that you know people who are Black, who are queer, who are who have learning disabilities um you know who are athletes who get used for their bodies to generate money and then discarded by the university when they seemingly become a problem these are all the things that that create what a viral underclass is and my kind of aha moment in that was that his story happened uh, in a county just west of St. Louis, outside of St. Louis. But then when I got sent back there to report for The Guardian about the killing of Michael Brown, another young black man named Michael, uh, I worked with the same HIV people I'd worked with before and asked them what to look for when I arrived in Ferguson. And they told me they had been in the Canfield Green apartment complex recently there have been new infections and Ferguson had this higher rate of HIV and AIDS. And so I started seeing that the same dynamics, black poverty, uh, you know, concentrations of police violence could, could be a map to where the HIV virus was. And that when you looked at places that had these social factors, HIV was more likely to be there. And when you also understood where HIV was in the country, you were much more likely to also see economic violence, racial violence, police violence happening to the same people. 
So when the viral underclass gets blamed and then when you have a scapegoat like Michael, it makes it a lot easier for uh, the people who want to maintain a status quo of a, say, for-profit healthcare system, one that uh, leaves people to... to uh, face their health care burdens on an individual level. It makes it a lot easier to uh, maintain that system when an individual can get blamed and then not just an individual, a large group of people where there already is this kind of muscle memory in society of black bodies in particular being like impure, tainted uh, vessels. Uh, and, and I mean, I'm reminded of like uh, the, the crack baby theme and how mothers would get blamed for uh, if a baby uh, was experiencing uh, complications post birth because of those things, like those, th that trope is a th is to use this again a through line, and it it creates like a, a deflection of blame downward as opposed to upward. Yeah, so you know, for me, kind of the the move out of the the move in the book out of my dissertation, um, which my dissertation research and the prior reporting was really very much concentrate on race, race interacting with sexuality. And in the book, I'm thinking about a viral underclass happening across 12 different vectors. And race is probably the most important. It's the first one, and it interacts with many of them that I write throughout the book. But there are multiple ways it can happen. And it does, as you're talking about, intersect with these sort of racial tropes and this muscle memory that we have about the racialization of disease, you know, Dorothy Roberts' work, and, and the ways that we imagine a racialization and criminalization happening you know, the same way in the United States. Um, so for example, like you said, with the with the quote unquote crack baby theme, that's something that we think of in a racialized way. We think in a racialized way about uh, drug addiction as well. And so it's interesting, I think, that we can look back historically and see moments where uh, drug addiction and news media and politics really focus entirely around race or almost entirely around race, particularly with crack. And then when you see um, meth in the news or opioid addiction now, the race around it, the presentation of it is a little bit different. It's happening a, a great deal. And I write about this in the book in Appalachia um, and then the U.S. South and in, in rural communities that are very white. And so there'll be a bit of a perception around it. But for the people around, for the people for whom this is affecting, they are still interwoven with the racial history of it and the ways that uh, addiction and uh, racial prejudice are, are intertwined with one another in such a way that when we do see these outbreaks of HIV and hepatitis happening with the opioid crisis, uh, you know, throughout Appalachia, it is treated with the same kind of stigma. And those people are also part of a viral underclass. And one of the things that I'm hoping that readers might get out of it or policymakers might get out of it is that who is in the rate who is in the viral underclass can change. Uh, and a lot of Americans think that they're only a few steps away from being a billionaire, um, but they're really much, much closer to falling into this viral underclass at any time. And another sort of aha moment for me was in one chapter, I write about this dynamic happening in Greece. A lot of the beginning of the book is about the U.S. history and our history with race uh, and its historical legacy with the transatlantic slave trade. But if you look at England under Margaret Thatcher, if you look at England now under, you know, the, the Tory government, I write in the book extensively about the country of Greece uh, experiencing austerity after their economic crash and how the EU imposed austerity on them. You see the same ways that austerity will bring a viral underclass to people who are raced as white, but with all of the prejudice, all of the disparity, uh, all of the stigma that has historically come from, from racism. And I think that that's a call for a, a kind of solidarity that can happen from worker, working class people of all races and all nations around the world to defy the need to even create a viral underclass among, among people. I mean, and, and you write about this, too, uh, how this is essentially a lot of this muscle memory, too. It's not doesn't just go back to like the 80s with the example that I use or the 70s. But I mean, it's rooted in colonialism and race essentialism from that, which is like there was disease that spread during that time period through travel from different continents. And and black bodies also bore the brunt of that as well. Yeah. So when we look at in the past couple of millennia of human history, um, the slave ship is one of the biggest vectors of disease in, in modern or 
modern human history, human history of the, the last couple of, of millennia. Uh, and one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is really think about the vectors that move viruses as structures and as spaces, not as individuals, which contemporary news media so much will do. But the movement of uh, enslaved people from Africa to the Americas to uh, unearth raw goods to then send them to Europe to be made into manufactured goods and created into capital, which then were used to buy more humans and to create this triangle that was happening around the Atlantic. That process was one of the biggest vectors we've ever seen. The ship itself, people, only 20% of people would survive. I'm sorry, about 20% of the people would perish on the ship itself. And then, you know, unknown number would die of pathogens in Jamaica, or Brazil, what became the United States after they arrived. And so that process itself was probably, uh, you know, one of the most potent ways of moving pathogens. But when historically, when we look across all kinds of colonialism, it is one of the engines of how pathogens move. When we were moving, and neo, neo um, uh, you know, the neo form of it as well, when we were uh, looking at uh, where does HIV come from, you can really trace it to European colonists moving into the Congo and pushing what were called African porters deeper and deeper into the jungle where eventually they're, they're uh, cutting bush meat for meat and trying to survive. And it's probably in the process of butchering animals in that process that HIV moved into human beings. And it happens, you know, quite similarly now as climate change moves more living beings onto a smaller part of the globe, human beings are uh, coming into contact with animals more and more often and more zoonotic jumps are going to happen. What I find curious, and I don't deal with this in the book because I'm not quite sure how, what to make of it yet, and I saw it happen again with monkeypox, is that historically, we've seen viruses lodge themselves more often in the global south or in colonized countries than they were happening in the global north or the colonizing countries. But with the past, the past few outbreaks we've seen, we've actually seen a lot more happening in the colonizers' countries. Um, you know, COVID has been horrible in the UK. It's been the worst anywhere in the world in the United States. Something similar happened with monkeypox. We have polio coming back in the United States as well. Uh, and there's something about the ways that we, as the, the countries that historically have been colonizing, and you know, our quote unquote advanced industrial in terms of industrialization are actually facilitating a great movement of pathogens inside our countries. But those viruses and those pathogens are still settling into the viral underclass within our borders. Yeah, well, it, it's almost like uh, kind of the the dark and twisted consequence of globalization, which is like built on the back of, of like a colonial skeleton, right? So, I mean, that, that kind of, it, it's it's unfortunate, but in the end, it's just like chickens coming home to roost to a degree. I mean, but of course, in the United, then the people, the viral underclass within those countries bear the brunt. And you mentioned monkeypox a few times, so I wanted to talk a bit about it because I was disturbed to see a lot of the language being used that was contributing to stigmatization of LGBTQ uh uh, or gay men in particular in this country that it's it's like it's like that th there's whole swaths of this country who decide to forget about how stigmatized the gay community was during the HIV AIDS pandemic and I still feel like we don't reckon with it enough and there was just callous throwing around a very similar language and uh, stigmatizing talk that was used during that period when discussing monkeypox. And thankfully, it's not as deadly as other viruses, as you say. But what was your, uh, I guess, perspective on seeing some of history or at least historical language repeat itself within that context? Actually, uh, I have a very, very different perspective on it. I didn't see many problems with language. Um, I saw problems with the structures that created what was happening and not having enough resources go to it, but actually co-authored a piece in the Daily Northwestern where I'm a professor today. And I wrote a piece in Scientific American. I wrote a piece in The Guardian about this as well, that I thought it was really important to name exactly what was happening and to try to deal with it as, as specifically as possible. When I first started, and I'm not, by background, I'm not a, an orthopox virus expert. <laughs> I was not before this summer. Um, so I, I, this sort of family of viruses, I, I wasn't as familiar with. But when I first started reading that 98 to 90, 95 to 98% of the cases were happening among men who had sex with men, it seemed pretty clear to me 
that the mode of transmission must be sexual in some way. That's the only thing that we have in common. And, and yet the language often was sort of saying it could be anyone, it could be any kind of close contact, which didn't make sense. It, it, and still, you know, six months later, it's, it's not moving significantly outside of this community. Um, about 2% of the cases have been amongst women and children, and the rest have been among men. Um, and indeed, one thing I think that's an important lesson for viruses is to have a sense of humility and to understand that they change and to keep studying them to see what they're doing. And there was a significant mutation. Monkeypox had been studied for seven decades, but about five years ago, something happened to it um, in a way that seemed to, to change how it was moving. And so the symptoms around this version of it were not this outbreak of large lesions on hands and faces, back and feet from before, from close contact, but happening uh, on the genitals and, and inside the anus, um, mostly of gay men. And so something different was happening. And I thought that it was really important to name that, to understand that, to put the vaccination efforts towards that. And I think a lot of well-meaning people did not want to even say that that was happening because they were afraid of stigma. But something also uh, something else happens that I thought was equally dangerous, which there was a vacuum of information and people were scared to be next to gay people or scared, you know, might be scared to, to room with them or be in classes with them on a college campus. So I thought it was really important to name, like, this is how we see it's moving. It's happening. It seems to be moving through particular actions. I think there needs to be more research about them. And one of the reasons, just to give you an example of why I think it's it's good to focus on actions, is that if this is moving through uh, unprotected anal intercourse, that could be something that's also a mode how it's moving into women. And so we need to understand exactly what that is, so that you know women who engage in that activity, men, uh, people of transgender people, people of all gender uh, all gender identities, understand the action that could be what is causing it. Um, and I've been, I was very frustrated with the Biden administration at the beginning of this because they had a purchase order on 300,000 vaccines. They took a cheap wait and see uh, approach and a number of us have been calling before Pride about the need to, to get ahead of this and vaccinate. And then too often, I think the U.S. will say, if something bad didn't happen, it was a waste of money. And they don't do this, you know, you notice with terrorism or whatnot, they'll, they'll yeah. spend this money to say, well, we're going to stave off a terrorist attack. Um, but when we're all saying like Pride Month, is, you know, in April and May, Pride Month is coming up. Like, let's make Pride Month vaxathon around this thing everywhere in the country. Um, and they did not take us up on that. And so like the organizations and the people were sort of ready to do it. We just didn't have the vaccines. And the federal government finally got on it in July and August, and now we're going to need, you know, 10 million um, when we could have maybe snuffed it out much sooner. Um, I was surprisingly, uh, I was, I was surprisingly happy with a lot of the press coverage I saw, but there was not enough of it early on. And it is a challenge. And it's like, it's a very, very difficult thing to, you know, to talk openly sort of about what's happening when there's still so much shame about it gay sex and trans life. And when we have these horrible bills passing around the country, making it illegal for trans youth to get care or trans adults to get care and making it illegal to teach young people how to protect their bodies. Um, so I think that the, you know, we have to be very careful about the language we're using, but we can't shy away from what's actually happening. And the problem, which is not an easy one to solve, is that we still live in a very homophobic and transphobic society and undoing that you know is going to to take time and work diseases are going to come and go and we're going to have to deal with them with them in this environment um, but we really have to undo the, the underlying transphobia and homophobia and that unfortunately feels like it's very much going in the wrong direction in the united states certainly in uh you know many of these red uh, not only these red republican states but also from the point of the federal government which is not being proactive enough, even though it's controlled by Democrats. Yeah, fair enough. I guess I have like instances of Marjorie Taylor Greene saying these are groomers spreading it to kids. Like that's a little more prominent in my mind. Um, just because. Well, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I understand and I think it's well intentioned, but they're going to say that anyway. Yeah. Um, and I felt like if we, you know, in that moment when when there was a big push from a lot of public health people, and I actually wouldn't say public health people, from comms people and organizations that are not public health, to sort of say, oh, it could happen through any close contact. That actually opens the door to say, like, you know, don't let your kids around gay men because they might get monkeypox. Um, and there were, you know, which I find, as a scholar, I find this stuff interesting. There, there have been a few, it's like 200 in the world, pediatric cases, they're very small. Um, and those cases have mostly been extremely young infants 
who may have actually been nursing or, you know, get, get becoming positive with that virus. And they've all been fine. There have been no deaths. Um, but they may have gotten through nursing. And then they've been, you know, adolescents or teens. And those teens, you know, they also might be sexually active. And, and if it's moving through sex, like we need to let teens know how to protect themselves, especially right now when there's like the move in the country to to not talk about things. And you're right, Marjorie Taylor Greene is awful and is going to do those things, but she's going to do them anyway. So like we should still give the most accurate information and you just say, you know what, if this is moving through gay sex, like there's nothing to be ashamed about with gay sex. And I'm going to sit as a scholar and a journalist, like just try to find out how queer people can have the safest sex that they can without making them feel ashamed about the unfortunate uh, coincidence that that we are the ones being in the brunt. Actually, I wouldn't say it's a coincidence. It's part of it's part of my book because we we can't deny ourselves and our community the information we need to be sexually healthy. And and too often we're not even given that information in the first place. I want to pivot now just to COVID in particular, because um, in chapter three of your book, you talk about the pandemic responses between uh, I, it was uh, South Korea, right, uh, yes. versus the United States and just like how these different countries place value on like immediately in the U.S. It was how can we get back to work and how can we get essential workers, a.k.a. the people who are in the viral underclass, working class folk who are going to bear the, the front, uh, bear the brunt of of uh, the pandemic before we had uh vaccines how can we get them back to work immediately and then you see what's happening in south korea and it's just like an entirely different set of values yeah right and that book i write about um it's the only kind of textual analysis i do in the book which was fun for me to do but i'm writing about the movie parasite because that was a movie that really helped me understand these dynamics and also gave me an end to write about uh, public health things that happened very differently in the republic of korea and i think that we can learn a lot from other countries that don't, and I'm using this phrase um, in air quotes, quote unquote, look like us. I was at a panel the other day, or a reading the other day, and you know, somebody sort of angrily in the audience in the Q&A was saying that, you know, why can't we learn from, from Canada and the UK, these countries that look like us about what to do better? And I, and I challenged them and said, what do you mean look like us? <laughs> <laughs> um, and there, there are countries in Africa and Asia that look like us. And largely because my thinking has been trying to look back at um, research from Nigeria that gave us really great warning about monkeypox that was ignored, that would have helped us a great deal with what we're dealing with five years later. And of course, it, several countries in Asia have been giving us lead time on a number of things, not just in the past couple of years with COVID itself from Western China, but from the ways these countries, uh, several countries dealt with the first outbreak of a uh, different SARS, SARS-1, that happened in 2003 and lots of practices that came from that, that we could learn from kind of at a technical public health level. But with um, when I'm writing about South Korea as well in the book, I'm thinking about the relationship that populations have with their their public health sectors and with their government. And they're very different. In the US, we are generally distrustful of the government and certainly of, of public health interactions. Um, something else I found really interesting while researching the book that a predictor of how countries would do with COVID was not how big the country was or small it was or how rich or poor it was. It was what percent of the money that they did spend went to preventative care versus emergency care. And so that spanned very rich countries and poor countries. There are some extremely poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, where the country itself is very poor. They don't spend that much money on public health, but they've been investing for decades in public health campaigns around Ebola and uh, West Nile virus and malaria and things like that. And so when people have a relationship with a public health infrastructure and they may actually know the person who does these campaigns and they've been keeping them safe from Ebola for you know years or decades, and then they say, hey, you know, we've heard about this new thing that you need to protect yourself. They're, they're 
quite likely to take that rather than the United States where we spend like 90, 95% of our interactions with the healthcare system in the emergency room and people have literally no relationship with any public health until like the moment they expect to either die or be slapped with a $500,000 medical bill. It's very, very difficult to get buy-in. Um, and so Korea is, you know, is an example of a, South Korea is an example of a country where they actually don't have legal mandates the same way that we do here, but they've had really good buy-in from the public by continuing continuously telling people what's happening, very simply saying, this is what we know right now. And also saying like, we may know something in th different next week. And then when they go back the next week, they say, here's what we know now. And so they've been able to, um, uh, you know, keep people using masks and, and doing all kinds of things to keep each other safe in, in just a very, very different way than we do in the United States. But they're still touched by capitalism and the market. Um, they do have, though, in, in Korea, uh, a universal health care system, which we don't in the United States. And that's also a really big factor in countries is whether or not people have an, have an easy infrastructure to get the medication and treatments they need and knowing that they're not going to be economically bombed if they take advantage of, of medical care. And and I mean, I, I I also find it fascinating that the emphasis in the U.S. here is so often on like the uh, supply chain issues, the economic problems as a result of covid. And then when lockdowns are discussed in the media here um, about like what's going on internationally, it's authoritarian as opposed yeah. to the simple uh, data, the scientific medical data on deaths and infections and hospitalizations as a metric for beating COVID. And I think all of these, uh, the, the intersections of how we not just view like our frontline communities and but our how we interact with our healthcare system, as you say, is uh, you can draw a direct line to that. Yeah, it's, you know, it in the U.S., we get a lot of media about how draconian China is and how authoritarian it is. And, of course, China's had some very strict lockdowns, but those lockdowns have been pretty targeted. I mean, you know, in, in Beijing and Shanghai and, of course, in Wuhan, where the first outbreak happened. And, you know, you look across the past few years, 95 percent of the population has been moving relatively you know, freely without without issues compared to us being in this constant, you know, semi state of terror and death. Um, and even and even within that, not feeling extremely free to, you know, quote unquote, go back to the before times, which we shouldn't. You know, we, we've learned new things. Something I've been thinking a lot about the last week or so because of a, a conversation thread I've been a part of on Twitter um, was a, a public health colleague asking why it was that the film industry in the United States seemed to be the only one that still had really good cover protections. And if, if, I don't know if you're familiar with it all, if any of your viewers are, but I, I have a lot of friends who work in the film business and they still really mean business. You know, that they, they uh, it's extremely test oriented. Everybody's being tested every day, uh, certainly while shooting and, and several times a week leading into shooting projects. Um, there's extreme monitoring, there's isolation. And it's because I think there's an acknowledgement in that business that they, they, they cannot they cannot swap out their labor once they start shooting a project. Um, and that to me highlights the ways that U.S. industry thinks that jobs are essential, but the workers are not. You know, mm. the job the job needs to be done. If the worker gets sick and dies, then they just replace them with another one. Then they complain they can't find any workers, you know, but, but as if they, they didn't have a role in stopping the workers from getting sick in the first place. Uh, you know, in the film business, they see crew people as expendable as well. But even they have to acknowledge the reality that those crew people are interacting as biological beings around the talent and they cannot afford not only for you know tom cruise or whatever tom hanks movie stars to get sick um anyone once they're on camera they can't just swap out the actor and so they've instituted this way of protecting all of their labor um, so that and it's not altruistic that they're doing it still to to generate capital. But it's really revealing to me that because of the particularities of their business, they're doing something that all business should be doing. All, all businesses should not want their workers to die and they shouldn't just be thinking they can swap them in and out. And it's also probably not generating um, more money for them to continuously be looking at labor in other industries but so much of us businesses just seems to just have their head in the sand right now i, I was on a 
flight the other day and they were like saying that the, the captain who had seen was not wearing a mask before he went into the cockpit and you know, was saying oh we're going to be delayed because of staffing issues in the air you know in the traffic control tower well like why do we have so many staffing issues right now um this is the reason why and and i am i am quite worried having seen how poorly businesses have done how many governments are trying to move these decisions back to their businesses? New York City, I just saw uh, the mayor, Eric Adams, said he wants COVID decisions just to be made by by employers, that they will know best what's what's best. Um, and like anything else in terms of worker safety, I don't think it's good to let employers just decide what safety level should be. What do you say to the folks who uh, we were hearing a lot about? We should have just done herd immunity. We should have done what Sweden did. Um, uh, but... Uh, they they uh that hasn't aged particularly well no sweden i mean sweden has gone through several different rounds of things uh they also had an an extremely uh you know ghoulish uh policy around their their elderly that that's even worse than the united states i would say um and herd immunity was never going to work as a concept in general but we also specifically know right now this is not a virus that you get once and then have lifelong immunity. You know, you can get sick multiple times from it. So herd immunity or the idea that enough of the population is going to be vaccinated and sick in any time to protect itself, like that's going to last for a, a few months at most. Um, and having people get sick with this thing that's had so many bad effects as pretty bad mortality, but also has unknown long-term consequences, not only with long COVID, but just unknown sort of what, what's going to happen later, um, brings into relief the way that the U.S. is mostly given up on on pathogen um, mitigation as part, of, as, as part of our pandemic response. And with anything, influenza, uh, chicken pox, you know, monkey pox, any sort of disease that you're dealing with, part of an important Thing to do is to keep people from getting it in the first place and that's largely been given up on and to some ways i just i i find it confounding i i understand the sinister reasons why a local government might spend covid money on police as Biden suggested they do but in a self-interested way i i don't understand why you know these air purifiers are not being put in every room just to keep fewer people from getting sick and to keep workers from getting sick um except to understand it through the lens of when CDC director Rochelle Walensky said masks are the scarlet letter of this pandemic. No one wants to think about it. And it's almost like there's this collective will to not even address anything that could be done to reduce transmission because it's a reminder of this thing that that so many want to forget about and just act like isn't happening. Lastly, and I had so many uh, other questions, but unfortunately, we, we probably have to wrap after this. Uh, I wanted to touch on one of your chapters, uh, Chapter 7, Cages, which talked about uh, how the, the carceral state has essentially exacerbated the viral underclass conditions uh, in the way that it deals with houselessness in particular. Can, can, can you uh, just talk a little bit about that chapter for our audience? Carcerality is one of the major drivers of pandemics, and I've seen that with HIV and AIDS for many years, even though HIV is a what I would call a very inefficient virus. It actually doesn't, it's very hard for it to move between people. It needs many opportunities to take hold in another person, and the prison still plays a big role in how it moves. And then you have something like COVID, which is an extremely efficient virus that that easily moves between people very casually. And sometimes you can see the math work out almost in a, in a one-to-one way. The US has 4% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners and people who are incarcerated. Uh, and we've also, I mean, we still have 4% of the population. We have 35% of the world's monkeypox cases. Uh, and we have pretty consistently had between 20 and 25% of COVID cases and COVID deaths. Last week when I was looking, it was almost exactly, the US had about 25% of the world's COVID deaths. And there is a direct relationship here. And, and you can think of it in various ways. Part of it is just where we spend our money. Biden is, again, asking for 100,000 new cops, as Bill Clinton did, and that's money that could go to other places. The amount of police resources that went to the city of, of Minneapolis towards cops um, are a reason why. I think George Floyd lost his job from COVID and did not end up you know, with safe housing and food and things he needed, uh, but ended up 
in a lethal encounter with a police officer. Some of that just has to do with where the money is going. Some of it goes to direct transmission itself. COVID is very much just being moved in prisons and jails. And I would say actually local jails are a bigger engine here than even prisons because the U.S. Keep, you know, moves hundreds of thousands of people every week into jails and they're there for a few days and then if they can bond out, they go home and then more come in and more go home. And so it's this direct engine of, of literally just moving the virus between human beings in these cages and then sending them back into their communities back and forth. But then prisons and jails also create what I call a, these secondary engines. Once you're incarcerated, you're much more likely to become homeless it becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get uh, long-term employment, good employment, the kind of employment that has you know, good health insurance. That, that almost entirely leaves uh, once people are marked by incarceration. And so the U.S. carceral system is physically moving the virus in a short-term way, but also subjecting people to long-term consequences that are going to leave their bodies more open to pathogens for the rest of their lives. Well, uh, Stephen Thrasher, I couldn't recommend uh, his book more highly enough. The Viral Underclass, The Human Toll When Inequality and Disease Collide. Um, thanks so much for your time today, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Emma. Take care.